All right, so hello everyone again. Uh, we're going to start with my report, which is on the Crypto 2016 puzzle solution and prizes to selected winners. Uh, so if you didn't get your solution in by now, I'm about to reveal the solution. If you don't want to hear it, run outside for a couple minutes, but let's go through it. So this was the um, piece of the text that was included in your packet that said use the gifts in your registration packet to determine the real security quotation. And let's talk about what it was that you received. First, you got a t-shirt. And this is the back of the t-shirt. And it has a number of quotations on it. And it has some symbols at the beginning and the end of each quotation. And if you zoom in on that, you saw a little film strip. And that was supposed to clue folks that these were somehow film or movie related. Now, why are there a bunch of security themed movie quotes on the back of your t-shirt? Well, because in addition to being general chair of this conference, I'm also president of the board of directors of the Seattle International Film Festival, which is the largest film festival in North America and runs for 25 days in Seattle from late May to mid-June. And if you're ever in Seattle, please come to the film festival. So I thought that a film themed, security themed puzzle was appropriate. Um, and I should, before I proceed further, acknowledge Josh Benelow. Uh, Josh and I worked on this jointly, um, and we, the two of us put this together for all of you to enjoy. So would everyone please kind of thank Josh. Okay. So there's movie quotes. There is this thing now called the internet, so you don't have to actually know all these movies in your head, but if you go and look them up or happen to know them, you would find that the movies that these quotes came from often had a security-related theme. Imitation game, Ghostbusters didn't, although it was about containment, sneakers, hackers, Inception, Spaceballs, and my personal favorite, Blade Runner, which had to make it into the puzzle. Now, the second thing on the shirt was that symbol down in the lower right, which was the picture of the wine bottle highlighting the little round thing in the lower right of the label. And then you got a wine bottle with a custom label on it. This is back door red or backdoored wine. Um, and my thanks to Michael Moniz of Liberton Hotels in Toronto, who did the graphic design for me as a favor um, of the label. Again, Josh and I gave a basic design. And if you look at that symbol on the label, it says that, which is a key to understanding how to unlock the puzzle. It's a very simple substitution cipher. You take the key, you take the first letters of the films, and remember, there was a hint that the is an insignificant, can be an insignificant word, so you didn't look for the T in the imitation game, but the I. And when you translate that, you get theater, which completes the security, should not be confused with theater, also a reference back into film. Okay, so that was the puzzle. We got 15 correct submissions. I want to acknowledge everybody on here who got a correct submission and got and turned it in by four o'clock. I particularly want to highlight Shai Halevi's children, Gil and Sharon Halevi, who got a solution. These are in order of submission. So they were the third correct solution submitted and the youngest submitters, okay? Now, of these 15, I have, pri I have randomly selected, or Excel's random number generator, randomly, and if you, you know, randomly selected three people to win prize. I have real prizes up here for three of these people. And would Marshall Ball, Jeremy Jean, and Aron Tromer please come up to receive prizes for correctly solving the puzzle. Okay. So they are identical. So Aron, there you go. Congratulations. Marshall, there you go, congratulations. Aaron, there you go, and congratulations to all three of you. Thank you for the trip down to the Memphis Memory Lane. You're most welcome, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And with that, that concludes my report on the Crypto 2016 puzzle. Thank, Thank you, you Brian. all. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So um, I, hope, I hope the prize winners enjoy, enjoy their backdoor to run and num number generators that they're getting as prizes. And <laughs> I'd like to invite Matt Rothschild to take oh. the stage. And next on stage is Barb Perdiel. If Barb could get ready, thank you. Matt. Yeah, just to uh, remind people that uh, please come and, and sit. And if there's too many people standing, there's an additional room uh, in the multimedia pavilion 
And if you don't, if, if you don't sit down, then the rump session will be stopped by the fire marshals. We really don't want that to happen. So please take a seat or go to the overflow theater. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so um, good evening. It's traditional to start the rump session with a report from the program chairs uh, behind the scenes on the submission and review process. Um, so it's my pleasure to provide that for crypto 2016. We received uh, a new record, so in the spirit of the Olympic rump session, we have a, a new record to report. Uh, 282 submissions, uh, reduced to 275 after withdrawal. Um, we accepted 70 for the program, uh, which represents roughly a 25% acceptance rate. And here we see the historical acceptance rate over the last 24 years, so we're back to the levels we were seeing before the year 2000. Crypto now is getting up to around about 1,000 reviews. And given that a paper length can be up to 30 pages, that's an enormous amount of reviewing. So we had a very dedicated and hardworking program committee uh, that went through all of this work. So thank you to all of them. Uh, we also had 320 external reviewers involved. So many of you will be in this room. Thank you very much for your contributions. Again, in the Olympic spirit, we can call out some nation contributions. So there were six countries that provided at least 5% of the submissions. France, US, Israel, China, Japan, and Germany. And this translated through so 65% of the submissions from these countries alone, translating into 71% 70, of the final accepted submissions in your program. Of course, there's different ways to measure cryptographic productivity. And the gold medal for the best use of available landmass goes to Singapore with one paper for every 350 <laughs> kilometer square. So the rump session marks the halfway point of crypto 2016. So you're probably already thinking about next year and maybe making some submissions. Um, so it's worth doing a little data mining to see what we might learn from this year. So the number of co-authors. I've presented here the acceptance rate for papers with single author papers here. You can see it's very hard to get a single author paper accepted, so congratulations to those that achieve that. And as we add authors, things get progressively better. You get a higher acceptance rate until basically after four, it drops off. Probably a little bit too much partying takes place. So it seems that four is a good number for the number of co-authors. Um, you also want to think about your first impressions, the title, because remember, the reviewers are going to make a bid for your paper to review your paper. So it's probably interesting to look at how you structure your title to the paper. And short and pithy certainly wins the day. So titles that could be characterized as short and pithy had an above average acceptance rate of 30%. Now, what's interesting is that you don't want to get caught in this kind of no man's land of middle length titles. <laughs> It turns out, if you just keep piling in the words, you can actually move on to something that's not short and not at all pithy. And you'll find you have pretty much the same acceptance rate at the end of the day. So short or long, one or the other. Um, what about some of the words? Were there any interesting keywords? So the committee liked <laughs> the following words in the title. So a green thumbs up means, you go, it means papers or submissions with these words in the title had an above average chance of being accepted. So practical, efficient, and cryptanalysis. Uh, the money word for crypto 2016, though, was applications. I had a very high acceptance rate, so that's kind of interesting for next year, perhaps. Um, on the other side, which were the words that didn't quite capture the program committee's imagination? Well, somewhat controversially for a crypto conference, I think, encryption <laughs> didn't do well. And Really quite disturbingly new, didn't do quite so well either. So, um, so anyway, so hi hindsight's a wonderful thing, and we can you know, construct what would have been an ideal title for crypto 2016. Oh, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Let me, let me go on. Some people uh, like to punctuate their title. Makes it a bit more interesting, a bit more subtle, a bit more considered. So the committee liked parentheses. Yeah, get a little thumbs up there, so above average acceptance rate. The committee went bananas over colons. <laughs> colons were very popular. Um, but the question mark, uh, maybe it implies a little indecision or something for some reason that didn't quite uh, capture the imagination of the program committee. So bringing all this together, we can come up with what would have been the ideal crypto 2016 title, as I say, with hindsight. And this would have been a good title. <laughs> Efficient cryptanalysis, colon. No practical in parentheses, applications are secure. And it would, of course, have been by four, four authors. Okay. 
So I'm the one talking, but crypto relies on the contributions of many. So a big thank you to John and Brian, my uh, program co-chairs, and Brian, the general chair. Pleasure to work with you. The excellent hardworking program committee, all the sub-reviewers, and most importantly, everyone who submitted to Crypto 2016. And I hope you enjoy the RUMP session. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next up we have uh, something about feng shui by somebody called Bart Pernil and Nigel Smart. Come to the stage, please. And could somebody bring me a beer? That would be really appreciated. So, so the interesting thing to note is that, of course, everybody knows that Bart is the ex-president of the IECR, so unsurprisingly, his favorite uh, discipline is hammer throwing. <laughs> well, this is a plug for a Usenix paper, but clearly this title would never have made it to crypto. So there is, in fact, way too many authors um, and I, the theme in, in, I chose was indeed hammer throw because I was thinking of field hockey. But today, actually, the Netherlands beat, was beaten by Belgium in field hockey, so I guess Martin would have rejected my paper if I did. So <laughs> I didn't take any risks there. So it's a very confusing title where many authors, we each chose a word, and then we put it together, and somehow it got into use next. So what do we really do? Okay. This. We broke RSA in the cloud. So how does it work? We use some very simple ideas and some simple crypto machinery, but very clever software stuff, done by co-authors at the University of Amsterdam. So we used actually two basic building blocks. One is Rowhammer, and I hope you all know that Kenny is Scottish. So I knew you actually would accept this paper with those beautiful pictures of Scottish people. So Rowhammer is a very cool trick in which you can actually flip bits in DRAM as a consequence of higher densities in DRAM by reading repeatedly adjacent rows. So you never have to write in the memory, you just read a lot, and at some moment you flip bits in the middle row. So now you already understand why there is flip in the title and why there is hammer in the title and why I chose the hammer throw. Okay, so it's a bit tricky to find out actually if you're in the cloud, which bits flip. And Practical guys from our team, they spend about 10 minutes of effort to find one bit flip that works. So this is why we don't use 100 and 100 so bit flips, and you can't completely control the location. The next thing is memory deduplication. So what happens in the cloud, you actually can rent your machines with the cloud providers, and actually they try to be efficient. And using this, an attacker can actually map the physical memory page of the victim virtual machine to the attacker go to the address space. The scenario is that somebody has a cloud instance which you want to attack, so you actually also make a cloud instance, and then from your cloud instance, you're going to attack the keys of the other guy. And how do you do it? Based on duplication. And the Feng Shui part is because we have to neatly arrange memory in a harmonic way to actually get to do it. And this explains the Feng Shui part of the title. So how does it work? It's very simple. You have this blue virtual machine. You have the victim, so the, the, the host, you have the victim having his machine, the attacker having his machine, and so each has their own physical memory at the bottom. And so what you do as an attacker is you put content in your virtual machine, which likely the attacker will also have. It can be a list of keys that's public, public keys, of course, or maybe some other things, in this case, the picture. And so what will happen in the cloud is actually that the cloud will want to be efficient. What they will do is they will actually spot this duplication, it will save memory, and put it together with pointers. The next thing is, if you then start flipping bits in your virtual machine using Rowhammer, what will happen in the physical memory, it will be updated, and you actually now flip the memory of, of the victim. Without doing anything, you don't have to violate any of the access control rules of the cloud. You actually go to the software stack with your needle, and you flip the bits. So what can you do in practice? Somebody is running OpenSSH in this cloud instance. You start an SSH session with the wrong key, doesn't matter. What the victim will do is read the authorized key file with an RSA modulus. You now do your row hammer bit flip, and you flip a bit of the modulus. So it's no longer an RSA modulus. It's now a random integer of 4,000 bits. That turns out to be easy to factor. So the method we use to add the elliptic curve, elliptic curve factorization depends on the second largest prime factor. And there is good statistics about this. We know that on average, it's about 20% of the size of the modulus. So, and if you're lucky, of course, it's even much smaller. 
That's it more or less, we used Stammer tool. This is the wrong sport, I guess, but okay. So, <laughs> 24 bit moduli, you can see we can factor almost all of them with 10 bit flips. What we used was about one hour time on a big cluster, 64 gigabyte RAM, then we stopped, if we, we abandoned if we couldn't make that. With that 48 bit, we could do more, or a bit, a bit less, but we could still get very close to all of them with 30 bit flips, and then 50 bit flips, we got up to 80% of all 4,000. 96 bit module. And of course, this was tried on real cloud instances, really in the cloud. We made this work in practice. Of course, we did warn the cloud providers in advance that they should implement countermeasures against this attack. Similar thing on GPG. You can actually use the update mechanism in Debian and Ubuntu, the APT. You first modify the sources list, so in fact, malware will be downloaded rather than from the real URL. At the moment of the signature checking, you actually flip the RSA keys, the trusted GPG file. You factor again until you enforce the signature, and now install malware in the victim's machine. Again, you factorize, and that's it. So we also have extension to DVL now. The problem there is that the publicly available software for this read log is not as good as the other factoring. So we didn't get as far for DV Hellman as for RSA, but the paper has the technical details. We also discuss mitigations, and if you want to find the paper, it's on there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Bart. Um, would Jeremiah please come to the stage? And next up, we have Nigel Smart. Just let's say um, there's loads of seats down here for those standing. Oh, yeah, thanks, Nigel. Please come and sit down, otherwise, we'll get shut down. And yeah, we don't come, want... please. If you're standing, please come sit here. We otherwise, the rump session will be shut. Right. Okay. Oops, what happened there? Last? Advance. Advance. Oh, there we go. No. What's my talk? Advance. Advance. Oh. Something's, whoa, 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 whoa. something's gone wrong. Have you, have you given me the wrong? Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, let's 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 go to <laughs> your jokes, yeah. let's you unwind your jokes. and we will have Jeremiah and we will do something to fix Nigel's talk at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your understanding, Nigel. Great talk. Great talk. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, like to give you a. A uh, quick update on the Crypt Olympic Games, which, as you know, are taking place uh, right now. Um, and I want to talk about my favorite event, which is password frequency list disclosure. Um, so uh, there we go. So um, some of you may be unfamiliar with this uh, exciting event. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, contestants start by collecting a large data set of user passwords. Um, and then they produce a histogram, uh, which is just a plot of the frequency of uh, the most popular passwords. And finally, the goal is to release a fre frequency list, which can be obtained by simply removing the passwords and just uh, outputting the associated frequencies. And contestants may perturb these lists to uh, uh, protect user privacy. So how are contestants judged in these uh, Olympic Games? Uh, well, there's three criteria. Um, the first uh, scoring criteria is uh, data set size. So the more users, uh, the better. Um, the second criteria is accuracy. Uh, if you can re release a frequency list that's more accurate, that's better. And the final criteria is privacy. Um, if you're not giving away uh, user passwords, uh, that's also better. Um, so you may think this is a game that I just made up, uh, but I assure you there's a long history of uh, organizations competing in this uh, event. Um, for example, uh, Rock U uh, uh, submitted an entry several years ago with uh, 32 million uh, user passwords. Unfortunately, uh, most of the previous contestants have had to be disqualified uh, due to uh, failure to uh, properly protect uh, user uh, passwords. So today I want to tell you about a new uh, leading candidate uh, for a uh, gold medal. Yahoo just turned in a very strong performance. Uh, they collected a data set of 70 million user passwords. Um, and uh, they used tools from uh, differential privacy to actually perturb these uh, password frequency lists before they were released. Um, so I should stress that uh, this data set's available, and it was released with permission. Um, so let's score this uh, entry. Uh, first criteria, accuracy. Well, we can actually compare uh, 
um, basic statistics like minimum entropy, guessing entropy, uh, that you'd get uh, with the sanitized data set uh, with the same statistics computed on the original data set. And we actually see that the statistics uh, match in almost every case, uh, with occasionally we'll get small variation. Um, and uh, what about privacy? Uh, well, they also had strong scores on the uh, privacy uh, criteria. Um, in particular, they uh, preserved differential privacy with the value, composite value of epsilon equals uh, 0.5. Of course, a single user might, cons might participate in uh, multiple different data sets, so you have to scale epsilon appropriately. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this means we can promise Alice that uh, you know, if we had removed her uh, password from the data set at the onset uh, before we ran the differentially private mechanism, uh, the probability of any subset of outcomes uh, doesn't change too much uh, when we exclude her, her password. So this means that the probability that Alice gets hacked uh, doesn't change too much, uh, you know, based on whether her uh, password was included or not. Okay, um, so password frequency lists have many uh, applications. Uh, the simplest one is just uh, estimate the total number of users that could be compromised in an online attack where the adversary has beta guesses per user. Um, there's lots of uh, other exciting applications. I hope you'll all um, search for the data set. If you just search for Yahoo Password Frequency Corpus, you'll find it. Uh, please play around with it. Uh, I hope that it's useful um, for you and uh, for many of you in your research endeavors. Um, and finally, I'd like to conclude uh, by uh, saying that I hope other organizations will challenge Yahoo for gold. Um, there are other organizations that uh, potentially could collect uh, larger uh, password frequency lists and follow the same uh, pattern and uh, perhaps uh, steal that gold medal from Yahoo. So thank you. Okay, so Nigel's now going to try again with his second presentation. Uh, but Kerry, if you're in the room, please get close to the stage because you might be on sooner than expected. Okay, and please take a seat if you're standing in the back corner. I can see you. Okay, I call you on your behavior. Please take a seat, all right? Or leave the auditorium, otherwise we'll get shut down. This one works. Nigel. Okay, this one, this one appears to work, okay. I don't know, there's something wrong with the computer. We're gonna fix. You'll see the other talk later, I've been promised. Okay, so this is about um, Speed's King. You're going to hear me sing. So if anyone gets the reference there, but it's far too old, really. Okay, um, but there's... Um, okay, except... Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm not actually going to sing, right? But if... <laughs> thank you, thank you for the... <laughs> that's exactly what I want. Yeah, thank you, I'm not going to sing. Um, but if you're interested in NPC, this is the rump session talk for you. Um, so we've got uh, three, uh, four things to announce. Um, Speeds is now open source, and I'm going to give you the link to that. It will be made open source. Um, it's not actually open source yet, but it will be by the end of the week. There's still some tidying up they've got to do. Okay, but everything's ready to go. Um, we're going to give you some timings we've achieved. Um, there's going to be a new conference on MPC, and there's going to be some jobs, because basically every bloody rump session I have to get up and tell you there's some jobs. Do you know where the jobs are? Which university? Bristol. Bristol, yeah, that's uh, kind of right. There we go. Okay, next one. Yeah, right, okay. So it's now open source. Um, hopefully now, um, well, it's going to be in the next couple of days. Um, the uh, documentation is as we, um, is, it's a little shaky. Um, um, if you want to sign up for announcements and to uh, find out uh, all about it, there's a Google group called speeds at googlegroups.com. And you can visit the web page, which is really long. Just type Bristol Speeds and you'll get it into Google. Other search engines are available for uh, Brian. Um, you, you can use Bing if you want, but Google will do it for you. Um, so that's, um, that's when you can see me fly. Um, if you're going to have a party, then you need large numbers of people to come to that party. So um, we decided we wanted a very large party. So we actually ran, well, Marcel did, he ran a 100-party auction. So this is, this is not sugar beet, because they only had three parties in their auction, and it was only semi-honest when they did it. This is a proper auction with 100 people, fully malicious, and we actually ran. So, this, so when people talk about multi-party computation, 
The record now is running a computation on 100 parties. We hope to be able to push it to 1,000 parties at some point in the next uh, few months. So um, the goal is now not to make things faster, but to have more people at your party. Um, and uh, we can now do uh, 22,000, 220,000, sorry, uh, uh, blocks per second of AES. This is not as good as Yehuda's um, record, which is going to be uh, presented at CCS, where he can do a million blocks of AES per second, and he's integrated it into a Kerberos system. But um, this is a system that will work for many parties, whereas Yehuda's thing only works for three. Um, there we go, so we've got some new kind of cool stuff coming up there. Um, and there's a new workshop. Um, it's, it's going to be, uh, if you go to the website, www.multipartycomputation.com, you know, why else would you choose a different <laughs> URL from that? Um, it's a bit like real world crypto, which you should have already heard about, okay? It's a bit like that thing, um, in that there's invited talks. Um, there's a contributed talks call that was announced today on the IACR website, and it's going to be held um, from April the 3rd to April the 7th in Bristol. It kind of continues on from the, uh, the, the event that used to be held every two years in Aarhus, but now we're going to hold it every year and we're going to move around Europe, probably. Um, um, oh, I should say that all of my slides have a sort of rowing epitaph, you see, to them, um, because uh, we're Great Britain. Well, we are currently. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we only excel at Olympic sports where we can apply our Formula One technology. So we're good at cycling, which you'd have seen in the real world crypto talk, but um, we're also good at rowing as well, because we could just apply technology to it. It doesn't have to be any good at athletics. Um, so that's um, why we've got the rowing uh, metaphor in all my slides, you see, because we're very good at that. And of course, rowing's quite good for multi-party computation, because you need many people to do a good rowing team. You know, if you, it's amazing, every year we have this Oxford and Cambridge boat race, I'm not quite sure how both of them get, always get into the final, but there we go, but there's eight in each team. Um, and so, uh, we, uh, so when you need a team of people to do rowing, you need extra people on your team. And so what I want to say, my last um, uh, slide is, I've just got paid. Shed loads of cash, right? And so with this shed loads of cash, I want to make a, bit, a better, bigger rowing team. So if you want to join our rowing team, come and help us spend the money. Um, talk to some of the postdocs who are here, they will tell you, Travel is no objective. And come and work for us. Five years, apply online now. Just come and do it. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. So, so um, if, you, if you'd like to be a galley slave in Bristol for five years. Hey, 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 yeah. <laughs> we, we, all, we also have postdocs at Royal Holloway. Please come talk to me. <laughs> And I'd like now to introduce Kerry Mackay, or Mackay, good Scottish name there, uh, from NIST. Thank you, Kerry. And next up, Marcel. Hi, I'm Kerry Mackay from NIST. You may have never seen me before because I generally don't like to give these talks, but here I am. So I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about lightweight cryptography and our standardization plans. So you may have heard of us, and we have these standards like AES, SHA-2, SHA-3. But the, what we're hearing from people is that AES is just too damn tall for the uneven bars. We need something a little bit lighter. So NIST initiated a, a lightweight crypto project to understand kind of where our, our standards fall short. So some of you may, might have come to our first lightweight crypto workshop uh, in July of last year at NIST, and we're going to hold a second one this October. And what we're looking for is lightweight algorithms for constrained environments and, of course, use cases. So how are we going to do this is the big question. It's something we've been struggling with. Uh, we did just last week put out our draft report, uh, NIST IR 8114, and it's posted for public comment. So you know, after you've had a few drinks, go and look at it tonight. Uh, it gives an overview of the project, includes our plan for standardization, which boils down to two essential things. We're going to recommend primitives based on the um, application and device profiles. Uh, and we're going to create a portfolio of the lightweight primitives through an open process similar to our 838 series for the modes of operation. And the reason that we're doing this is because if we try and do a competition for this, uh, by the time we finish with the standardization, no one's going to be using that technology anymore. So the profiles are really the key to what we have. So 
or, or the key to our plan. So we're gonna describe, we're gonna have profiles that represent classes of devices and applications, and we're gonna build these profiles based on public feedback. So this is just a template from the report. If you want more information about what actually goes in these fields, please look at the report. But in general, it's, um, we've got a primitive, the physical performance and security characteristics, and also some design goals. But here's the thing. We work at NIST and we're not actually out in the field using this stuff, but you guys are. So we really need your help in developing these profiles. So we have a list of questions in the draft report that we need your input on. We need your answers. Otherwise, we're just gonna be a bunch of people just sitting in a room making stuff up. We'll try our best to make up something useful, but you actually know what you need, not us. So right now we've got the draft report out. The comments are due uh, by October 31st. And if you are going to be awesome enough to help us out by answering these questions, to help us develop profiles, it would be really great if you could get those to us by October 1st so that we actually have time to draft some profiles to discuss at the workshop, which again is held, being held in October 17th through 18th, again at NIST. And the, if you want to participate in that, the deadline for submissions is September 9th. So if you would like to contact us or get more information mm -hmm. or join our mailing list, we have a, a, a lightweight email list like the hash forum. There hasn't been much activity on it yet, but hopefully that'll change soon now that the project is picking up. We also have information on the workshop and the project in general. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to speak up. Can you hear me at the back okay? Is it good? Yes, excellent. Thank you for one thumbs up at the back. Um, Martine would like a cup of tea, so if somebody could go fetch Martine a cup of tea, that would be great. And if someone could bring me a bottle of vodka, that would be good too, okay? <laughs> okay, and that's to prepare us for Marcel Keller, who's next up, and he's going to be followed by Johan Damon, so if Johan Damon could come to the stage. Thanks, Johan. Hi, Johan. Okay, Marcel. Uh, thank you. So I'm Marcel. I'm one of the slaves, so uh, come talk to me. Please! <laughs> Um, what I'm going to talk about today is homeopathic encryption, and uh, I have to say it's, a, it's essentially a shameless deal uh, by a work in progress talk from Usenix. I think it was Eric Wustro. I hope I don't misattribute, misattribute this. So uh, yeah, come talk to me if that's wrong. Anyway, uh, homeopathic encryption, uh, of course, it's going to be round-based because that's how uh, proper encryption schemes work. We start, unsurprisingly, with a message M and a key K, and uh, there we go. First round, with probability 2 to the minus 12.8, we're going to assign K to K, otherwise K is XOR, K, XOR, K. Uh, we continue with round 2, again uh, with probability 2 to the minus 12.8, K is equal to K, otherwise K equal K, XOR, K. And this already brings us to round number three, which says that with probability two to the minus 12.8, k is k, otherwise k is k x or k. And oh, that's already round number four. With probability two to the minus 12.8, k equals k, otherwise we assign k to k x or k. And uh, now you might be surprised, there's round number five. Probability 2 minus 12.8, k equals k, otherwise k equals k, x or k. And let's quickly move to round number 6. <laughs> Probability 2 to the minus 12.8, we assign k to k, otherwise, that's with probability 1 minus 2 to the 12.8, uh, we assign k, x or k to k. And then there's my lucky number, round number 7. Probability 2 to the minus 12.8, k equals k, otherwise k, k x or k, uh, yes, oh yeah, there's one more, that's now round number eight, probability, so we flip a very heavily biased coin, essentially in all those rounds, uh, 12, 2, probably, oh man, probably 2 to the 12, minus 12, one eight, we assign k to k, otherwise k is going to be k, x or k, 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 K. Uh, oh, yeah, there's round number nine. Um, um, yeah, I think we have to get, go to 10, 12, 14, 
AS style, uh, 2 to the 12, minus 12.8, 12 resign K to K, otherwise KEX or KKK. K. 10, oh yeah, there's one more. You're gonna be surprised. Uh, 2 to the minus 12.8, K equals K, otherwise K equals KX or K. And, oh yeah, finalize. Uh, <laughs> Ciphertext is gonna be C equals M X or K. Uh, so that's the scheme. Uh, let's talk about the implementation. So uh, we, as you might have seen, that we rev heavily rely on fast random number generation. Uh, and of course, like I know there are chess people here, so you're really concerned about, you know, embedded systems, hardware, maybe there's no fast random number generation. I can assure you, I don't have time for this, but there's a slight tweak to the algorithm that uh, makes this algorithm much more efficient on restricted <laughs> systems. And last but not least, also uh, very important, the design encourages constant time implementation. So you, if you do if statements on either the message or the key, like you're really doing it wrong. Last but not least, there's also special properties. <laughs> so uh, we had a thought about this and like, it really, we're really sure about the fact that quantum attacks are really no better than classical attacks on, on this one. So uh, that's like for the post-quantum Kropotkin community. And on the other hand, like for the fancy pants community, of course, it's also fully homomorphic. And, uh, and now here's a nugget for the more, uh, how do say, like policy-oriented community. Uh, we think, we strongly believe that this one is particularly suitable for compliance and marketing because it's encrypted after all, right? And uh, this already concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marcel. Um, hilarious as ever. And uh, next up, uh, we have a talk called Kangaroo 12 by Johan Damon. And if Brian would like to come to the stage, uh, that would be great. Johan, take it away. Uh, yeah, good evening. So this is uh, a more serious talk, I'm afraid. It's a joint work with the Ketchak team and uh, Ronnie, so our colleague Ronnie. Um, yeah, I choose a sport, so it's a kangaroo. Uh, what does a kangaroo do? It boxes, but I don't know if it's an Olympic uh, discipline. Maybe it has been. Haven't seen any boxing, but OK, yeah. Our kangaroo boxes, and I think uh, you will need it. So what is it is basically um, hashing based on Ketchak P, a bit like uh, Chatri, yeah? a bit like uh, the shake functions, but then more efficient. So what we did is we did the exercise to uh, bring uh, Ketchak uh, more down to where it should be to, um, if you look at the, the safety margin, and we also try to exploit uh, parallelism. So first, the, the safety margin. So if you look at um, um, the state of script analysis, uh, up to now, the best attack, the best collision attack against uh, Ketchak is five rounds. And the best published, there may be some distinguishing stuff, but the best attack is five rounds. But it has 24 rounds. So we basically have more than four, and four a factor of four more rounds than we really need. So in Kiak, we already took that into account and we reduced the number of rounds to half, uh, to 12. So let's do also the hashing with 12 rounds. So we reduce from 24 rounds to 12 rounds and that still gives us a factor of two uh, safety margin. So then if we look at modern CPUs, we see more and more these SIMD instructions going broader and broader. So we have a lot of parallelism that we can do. And there's also many CPUs with many cores, and we would like to exploit that parallelism. But then um, in Sponge, basically, it's, it's a serial mode. So we introduce a kind of uh, tree hash structure, and that's basically what we did. So this is the structure of a Kangaroo 12. So these uh, blue blocks, they are basically the input blocks of the message. So we split our message into 8,192-byte blocks. And uh, we can do that in parallel. So you see there those uh, vertical bars that are um, all inputs to um, Ketchak, so to a Ketchak version with 12 rounds. And we can do them in parallel. And then we um, append the chaining values to the first block, this S0, 
and uh, that's, that's also one call. So each of these arrows represents a call to the underlying hash function, which is SketchUp with 12 rounds, and the whole thing is a tree hash mode. So you see also there are these chaining values, that's some more hashing you have to do, but it's compensated by the parallelism. So if you look at uh, these um, symbols 110 one, and so on, that's in fact uh, padding and frame bits that complies to the Sakura mode. So if you do it this way, you get a, a provable reduction of security to the security of the underlying hash function. So what does this give us? Uh, something went wrong with the slide, but okay. Um, yeah, there was, there was a kangaroo there. Um, so on the, uh, on the Haswell and Skylake, for short, well, for short messages, you reach about something below uh, around four, uh, between four and five cycles per byte, but for long inputs, you can really exploit this parallelism. So for instance, for the Haswell, you uh, get down to 1.44, for Skylake, 1.22 cycles per byte. So there you exploit uh, four level, uh, four wide parallelism. And on this new uh, CPU, Knight's Landing, basically you can get down to uh, 0.74 cycles per byte. So there we put a paper on ICR, and you can find the code that uh, has uh, achieved these results in uh, the Ketchup code package that's made public by Jill. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to emphasize that no kangaroos were uh, harmed in the making of that talk. We just don't like kangaroos. And here comes Brian. Okay, back. Brian I'm Lamakia back. Brian is back for I'm something back. special. So uh, for what we're calling the uh, charity auction, or a long jump for charity. So for the purposes of this talk, I am representing the Great, the Great Britain and their team in the long jump, uh, for reasons that'll become apparent in a moment, for as long as Great Britain it still exists. Um, Iran thanked me for taking you down a walk on S Cinema Lane. I'm now gonna take you a walk down IACR Lane. In particular, I wanna go back 25 years to Eurocrypt 1991. Who knows where Eurocrypt 1991 was held? Okay, Kenny, go ahead. Uh, Brighton in the United Kingdom, my, it first, was, my first ever Eurocrypt. It was your first Eurocrypt. It was my first Eurocrypt as well. And it was here at the University of Brighton in the UK. And who was the general chair? It was Andy Clark, that's right. And what was the Eurocrypt 1991 special beverage that everyone got? Beer. In particular, something that looked like this. It was Eurocrypt 91 Celebration Ale. And it was my memory of this beer that Andy did that caused me to think about doing a custom label for something, which is why we have a wine bottle here with a nice custom label, because I kind of grew up from the beard and the wine. <laughs> now, I accepted to be general chair two years ago, and about six months after that, I was cleaning out an old box in the back of my closet that had been there probably since graduate school days that I had moved from a bunch of places to places and I'd never seen the light of day and I found this little cardboard box here from Harvey and Sons. And when I opened it up, I found inside one unopened original bottle of Eurocrypt 91 Celebration Ale. <laughs> Best before end date, July 91, <laughs> okay? It was in April. So I thought, what should we do with this bottle, since it's a special occasion and it's 25 years, and I thought the thing we should do was to have a charity auction to benefit the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Now, so I'm about to auction this off for charity. Open your wallets up. Why National Museum of Computing? Well, because that Andy is a director and trustee of that, and it's his favorite chair, and he's trying to bring it back. So I thought a way that we could honor Andy and Eurocrypt 91 was to auction this bottle off. So someone here who bids high enough is going to get to walk home with this bottle tonight, or make me drink it if they pay me enough. Uh, <laughs> and I hold my fellow members of the board of directors, and they have pledged along with me to match the donation that is made by the winning bid tonight, if the clicker will advance. So we will get a 27 time multiplier on whatever this goes for that will all go to charity, okay? With some limits so that people don't get too crazy, okay? <laughs> so what I would like to do right now is open the bidding for this bottle of beer, and since it's 25 years old, I thought I'd open the bidding at 25 cents. 
Does someone offer 25 cents? $10. Okay, I've got a bid of $10. I got a bid back there. How much? $20. $100 over here. And I'm going to hold you this. Thank you very much. Wow. Fantastic. All right. I've got a bid of $100 for a Eurocrypt 91 Celebration Ale. How much? $200. I've got $200 in back. I will offer. He's bid $200. $250. I got $250. Do I hear $300 in the back? How about $275? <laughs> come on, it's for charity. Two, come on, $275. All right, I got $250 over here. Anyone else? Come on, somebody wants to go a little bit higher, right? It's for charity. 256! I got 256! Whoa! All right, all right, 256. It's 512 to you. <laughs> or maybe I'll let you go to 384. 384, I got 384 over here, fantastic, okay. Tom, 384 back to you. No, you're out, you're tapped out. Too many bits, huh? Okay. I have $384 over here bid for this bottle. Oh, you bid dollars? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. We'll be here all night. 384. Anyone else? Anyone want to top it? 400. Four and some other weird number added onto it. 512. All right. I'm going to take that $384 bid and I'm going to let it go once, twice, last chance folks, sold for $384. I think we have raised well a lot of money tonight for the National Museum of Computing. Please meet me afterwards. We're about to go to the break, and we will discuss how to make sure that everybody gets tax deductions appropriately for donations. <laughs> okay? Thank you all again. I believe this is the first break. Yeah. So we will see you all at 2045 for something special involving vegetables. Okay? 2045. <laughs>